Um, first up, a straight apology. The, this is not really my presentation or my slides. I'm going to do the absolute best that I can to um, give you a, a good insight and an interesting insight into the survey that's been undertaken. Um, but I may not be able to answer all of your questions at the end. So what am I talking to you about today? The Characterising the Community Survey um, that we undertook uh, as a group, we being ARG, um, it, under the auspices of the EAC Remote Sensing Working Group. So most of you will be familiar with the EAC Working Group. It is a partnership between ourselves and ISAP. Rachel Opitz and Chris Gaffney lead on that. Um, and they're also the, it's the umbrella under which we're also doing the LIDAR guidelines and work. So within that Remote Sensing Working Group, um, what they're doing is working towards the EAC aims, which are to help support heritage management across the continent of Europe. Um, and how can we do that? Well, one of the things that was done last year for ISAP members was to undertake a survey to try and characterise the profession. So what we really want to know is who is doing what and where and how? What are the problems? What are the potential solutions? And essentially what we're trying to provide in both of these surveys, both the ISAP members survey last year and the ARG members and wider community survey this year is a baseline. We're trying to find a, trying to make a starting point from which we can understand and characterize how aerial archaeology and remote sensing is being undertaken across Europe um, and the kind of things that we think are coming up that might be both opportunities and barriers um, to, to um, applications. Um, so this survey was undertaken over 10 weeks at the beginning of um, this year between May and June. Um, we had uh, more than 55 responses. So this responses were split as with the LIDAR survey for institutions and individuals. So you could respond on, on behalf of an organisation and talk about the way that the organisation handles remote sensing, or you could speak about your particular role. The reason that we did this, both for the LIDAR survey and for this characterising the, the profession survey, is that A, it's really interesting to see the difference in dynamic between how an individual working with remote sensing um, is approaching their profession and, and, and the things that they do, uh, and how an organisation who is employing people or looking um, to use remote sensing is, is operating. Um, but also because if we just focus, say, for example, on organisations, that would exclude quite a lot of people who are working uh, self-employed or as individuals or as researchers who don't sort to sit within the umbrella of an organization. So for us to properly try and capture the, the, the demographic, we need, to, we need to ask both questions. What that does mean is that some people will have responded both on behalf of themselves and on behalf of an organization that they work for. So you have a sort of double entry uh, respect uh, to, the, to the data there. So as you can see here, we had pretty good coverage but, uh, from institutions and, and relatively good coverage from individuals as well in terms of the geographic spread. And we did also get some individuals responding um, from Atwith uh, Europe too, which you know it is, is interesting also to, to start to understand the, the, the more global spread of, of our discipline. Um, a quick and um, quite boring slide here, so apologies for that. Um, but really, I just wanted to show you the kind of breakdown of, of which sort of um, uh, organizations and which type of roles responded to to the survey um, and I think the one thing to see you can all read, read the slide through for yourself here is that we had a reasonably good response rate from individuals both as researchers and commercial archaeologists um, and a reasonably good response rate from academic researchers and development-led archaeology but to put this in context so a 2021 report done by um, Doug Ox McQueen and co surveyed the entire archaeological um, profession in, in the UK to try and understand the numbers um, of, of organisations. And so they, they uh, concluded that more than 200 universities were offering uh, courses related to archaeology and that there were more than 1,000 independent archaeological organisations. So looking at those numbers, sort of 200 universities, 1,000 independent um, archaeology organisations, and then taking a look at the scale of these, we need to understand how representative this is of the total number of people working within it. So it's it looks like a really low response rate, but we also know, as we spoke about this morning, that aerial archaeology and remote sensing is a small specialism within a much broader um, subject. So further work on understanding where this research sits within the wider discipline would, would be useful to pick apart how representative these, these responses actually are. Um, 
We looked at, we asked people um, what, what sort of things that they use um, remote sensing and archaeology for. The format of the form was predominantly um, a quantitative survey, so people could use uh, checkbox and, and, and radio controls in order to be able to give quite standardised responses. Um, and the idea of that is to allow us to take that baseline and then repeat the survey at periodic intervals. I think probably about a five-year um, interval would, would seem appropriate, although that will be uh, for discussion with the AOC and our committee. Um, so you try, and also trying to make it as easy as possible for them to respond. However, there was a mix of qualitative responses as well. We asked people to give uh, comments and views, and we'll take a look at some of those at the end of this um, talk, because it does provide a quite interesting insight into to people's feelings around where they are at the minute. So as you can see, um, the vast majority of organisations are using um, remote sensing and aerial uh, photography for project planning, desk based assessment and the supportive field work, um, and then followed by site identification. Perhaps the thing that's um, outstanding from this particular graph is that public engagement seems to fall really low um, on the uh, on the sort of registered uses. Um, also bearing in mind that people could pick more than one choice here. But across the across the, the scale, across the responses, public engagement was quite low. Now, I think that we're probably using remote sensing and um, aerial photography quite quite a lot in terms of public engagement, but perhaps we're not really thinking about that um, as as part of our, our job. Maybe we're doing it of an evening, perhaps we're doing it as something um, a, alongside our, our main role. And so I think that the actual use of remote sensing, or, or Rachel and I, and, uh, I think that the actual use of remote sensing and aerial imagery is much higher in terms of public engagement, but we're not perhaps recognising that quite so much as a discipline, um, particularly from an organisational point of view. Um, an example of that might be if you're putting an aerial photo in a slide of a wider presentation about a site that you're giving, you're maybe not giving recognition to the fact that you are still using that, that photo as a resource. Um, we asked people what they thought, what had been invested in in the past and what they thought would need to be invested in in the future. So this splits down into four different, uh, five different categories, sorry, infrastructure, equipment, training, data and staff. Um, and what we can see on this graph is the discrepancy between what an individual's view on each of those needs are and the organisational view um, in terms of, of past and future investment. Um, so as you can see, uh, most uh, organisations are planning to invest more in infrastructure than they are in staffing, for example. Um, perhaps indicating that they feel like they already have the human resource in place and they don't need any more speci specialists undertaking this sort of work, but they do need to be able to equip them with computers and servers and the ability to handle larger amounts of data. But what we can also see is that in the past, um, they are expecting, or organisations are expecting a significant drop in investment in data itself. And this probably reflects the fact that we have far more um, open access data available to us than at any other time that people have been studying this. So I think there, there is a, a mirroring here of the expectation that we will not be needing to spend as much money acquiring data in the first place. Now, where that leaves specific survey acquisition programmes is, is quite a big question. And there's something to be asked there, I think, about the nature of um, proper bespoke um, prospective survey and where that sits within our discipline and why perhaps we're not thinking about investing in that um, alongside. So other things that were pulled up in terms of this particular part of the survey, in terms of investment, um, that there's a need for more training and education, that people generally felt that there weren't quite enough opportunities, um, both at the academic level, sort of formal training, but also within and, and, um, and between peers within the discipline. Um, the basic image interpretation skills were essential, um, but alongside those, it was also the ability to understand the pitfalls. So what we're talking about here is are two needs, a need for training, but then also a need for experience, because to be honest, um, image interpretation skills are something that you only get by doing, aren't they? They're something that you have to do, you have to participate in. Um, so to get experienced, you have to, to be experienced. Um, and then the final thing that sort of came out from, or Rachel pulled out from this particular part of the survey is that the, the use and storage of data from remote sensing surveys um, was, was a constant kind of um, grit in the oyster, so to speak. It was something that was raised time and time again. How do we handle um, the large amounts of data? Um, and in certainly I can speak for the, for the UK situation is that where we have um, 
bespoke surveys, often those done on a project by project basis. At the end of the project, because the finances run out, the staff move on. And so that causes us a huge problem because we have no centralised repository for that data to go. So these data have been collected with public money, usually LIDAR data have been collected with public money. And at the end of a three year or a five year project, they sort of sit on a hard drive somewhere with the host organisation who doesn't have the appropriate staff or skills or expertise to make those data available in the long term. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll quickly sort of whiz, uh, whiz through these ones because um, they just, oh, that was quicker than I was intending, sorry. Um, so this just shows the, the difference in um, the, the country's reporting of where they felt past investments had been. Um, so once again, you can see that quite a lot of countries uh, rated equipment quite highly as something that they've invested in um, in the past. Um, and then going forward, uh, really, it's, it's sort of equipment and infrastructure, um, but staff, um, with the exception, with a couple of exceptions, perhaps England, um, there, uh, um, not not expecting to make those same kind of um, investments in people. Um, we asked people to rate the skills that they had and organisations to rate the skills that they wanted in order to try and understand the gap between what was available and what what might be needed. Um, so here we have an image. Uh, demonstrating the top five health skills and the top five required skills. So looking at the, the number of instances where each of these were, were mentioned by respondents. Um, so respondents in the left-hand um, column and organisations in the right-hand column. So the thing to pick apart here really, or the thing to notice is that actually there's quite good correlation between this, the skills that are held and the skills that are wanted. We can see that we've, um, Rachel's very kindly mapped this in colour. Apologies to anybody who is colour blind. Uh, you're going to have to read the text more carefully. Um, but within the top five required skills, there's, there's a relatively good match between what people feel they have to offer and what businesses are wanting. In terms of the long list, and what I should have said at that point is that um, the offer of more than 36 different types of skill were made. So people had a, had a checklist to pick from. So when we talk about the top five, we're not talking five of 10 skills, we're talking five out of 36 possible um, skill uh, areas that were given. Um, and then here, here is the long list. Once again, you can see, oh, sorry. What happens when you press the forward button rather than the uh, laser? What you can see is there's a, there's a relatively good match, but as we look over the top 10, we're starting to see things being prioritized in a slightly different way. Um, so, for example, um, organizations are prioritizing GIS and map creation and the integration of aerial archaeology um, to wider project management um, more than necessarily individuals are highlighting that as a skill set that they have or that they are applying in their day to day work. Um, uh, Rachel brought out some more data um, along these lines, so really looking at what that gap might look like, trying to quantify the gap. So we've got counts of each and trying to see um, where, where those gaps might be. Um, so in terms of health skills and required skills, we can see that actually it's looking re reasonably healthy um, um, in terms of, of some of these. Uh, so that they're quite low numbers here. So for example, scripting, we sort of feel like we have the right amount of people available within um, the, the employee uh, cohort, um, but then others, so uh, once again, GIS, map creation and editing, that's coming really quite high at the top. Now these percentages all look tiny, don't they? 2%, what is that? But you're talking about a relatively small number of professionals, so 2% across a body of people that's only 55 strong is actually you know, a, a number of people. Um, and so we probably need to understand a little bit better how that gap actually manifests itself in terms of a lack of, of, of people with the available skills. What's also quite interesting is we asked each organisation to categorise themselves in terms of the number of people that they employed. Um, and we start to see some discrepancies here between the um, sorts of skills that are required or wanted or needed um, through the different sizes of organisation. Um, so really this reflects sort of what you'd expect in that smaller commercial organisations are sort of doing it all. And so they need a, sort of a, a, a rounder, um, set of skills, including that high prioritization of integration with fieldwork. They want their staff to be able to do remote sensing and fieldwork and, and all the other things associated with it, indicating perhaps that they're not so interested in employing one particular specialist to do remote sensing, but that person needs to be an all rounder, which makes perfect sense if you're a smaller organization. Um, and then we can see that moving through um, the the, the sort of the, the GIS management plan becomes more important as probably as you start to specialise more when you're engaged with a, a larger commercial organisation. 
And that correlation between GIS and data management and aerial archaeology and remote sensing obviously was touched on a lot this morning as we talked about the history of, of where we've come from and where we're going. Um, but it shows you how, how important those skills are. And I do wonder to what extent we're really training those and, and upskilling people to be able to hold them, those technical skills at the same time as having those really high quality interpretive skills. So not just being able to manage the data, but being able to understand it. That's just a personal observation. Um, this slide is will be kind of familiar to anybody who's been involved in any discussion about how well academia prepares people for the real world um, in archaeology. And so what we're seeing here is that things that are being prioritised um, within um, academic institutions are not necessarily being reflected um, across the board. So. It's, it's interesting to note um, the uh, production of visualizations, calculating of indices, the more technical um, uh, types of, of uh, skill set are not really being read across. Is that because they're not seen as being quite as important um, within the commercial and institutional skills yet? Um, I, I don't know. We need to ask a, a little bit more of that um, particular part of the survey, I think. Um, but there does appear to be more of a mismatch when you consider academic versus commercial and institutional uh, than when you consider individual and undesired skills. Um, not to bore you to it, because I do apologise sincerely that these slides are extremely small. However, the report is available for everybody to read and we'll be sharing the links later, um, as is the whole data set that underpins this. So really, the, the presentation that I'm giving today is, is an initial overview, some initial things that have jumped out from the data that have struck us as, as interesting or perhaps informative to the community. Um, but the data itself has been anonymised and made available on a Zenodo repository, so anybody can go back and look at this data and start to pull out things that are of more interest to them. Um, so here we can see um, a slide that is looking at the differences in skills held by individuals and those skills reported uh, as, as needed um, on a country by country basis. And the thing really to take home from this or that I think is important from this element is that because we are a relatively small and specialised community, it means that the ability to locate a specialist within your geographical area might be quite limited. Um, and so there, there is a potential there for not being that even if we have a skill that is well represented, it might be well represented, but not within the geographical area in which it's it's most needed. So there is um, an importance there to looking at that, that that spread of skills across the across the continent. So. Um, what do we think, what have we pulled out of this survey that we think is, is most needed? Looking forwards, what, what are we wanting to develop within our sector? So um, people highlighted the development of bespoke methods and algorithms, um, providing training and how to use these data sets, we've already touched upon that. Um, and the coordination of different specialisms, archaeology and other technical specialisms in order to, to, to progress the discipline. Um, one of the things that was highlighted when it comes to organisational work and individuals' uh, responses to how they felt their organisations were, were working for them is the, the ability to be able to connect the aims of the project to the choice of technology and the choice of data that is being used. And I think this perhaps um, indicates that, that there might be um, some issues around managerial or organisational understanding of what remote sensing can offer and what remote sensing can do. Um, technical interpretation and analysis skills, these have been highlighted as needed and to my mind that really comes back down to, to, to the training as, as well. How do we structure training? How do we make that available? Um, the ability to apply and deploy UAV, um, so that's uh, the, uh, 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 highly required. And finally, big data management, so specialists and services that can help us leverage change um, from this. Um, I mentioned before that there are um, qualitative responses as well that you can read. Um, I'm hoping that we've anonymized them enough that people can't work out who it was, but maybe you can hear somebody's voice in your head as you read through these. Um, I think I certainly can in some instances. Um, so once again, highlighting things that I've already mentioned as part of this talk, that we feel like there are um, people that interaction of data management and interpretation really needs uh, work, that this is a specialist skilled area and that we're perhaps not supporting people well enough, particularly through the um, the, the, the tertiary education cycle, so through universities. Um, how much experience do people get? How much training do they get as part of their degree? Um, and, and I thought this was quite an interesting, that, that in fact, um, 
but many many areas are still really seeing archaeology and we, we've touched on this a little bit this morning as well that in sort of in the ukraine in ukraine um archaeology is still very much seen as the excavation of archaeology and not the wider discipline so how do we integrate the stuff that we do and the stuff that we're interesting and that we interested in that we know can make an impact um, within the the wider discipline and the wider management um, and this comes back to where the EAC will sit and how they will work with the results of this survey uh, on that on that management that cultural heritage management level um, I'm going to skip through this one because uh, we're running a little bit short on time, but there is still an indication, a sort of intimation that remote sensing is not trusted, it's not accepted perhaps um, in the way that it should be. So the question really and the challenge for us as a discipline is how do we how do we take on board some of this feedback? How do we move forward with it? So how can we make our work uh, more integrated? How do we advocate for ourselves so that people, there's not that so much of a mismatch between what we do and what we want to do uh, and what organisations want us to do or what we want to be able to contribute um, and and some so some of those sort of bigger questions that are relevant to ARG. So what is it that we want to achieve here? Um, I noticed Vikash mentioned that he was having a midlife crisis, so maybe that's something that he's going to be raising um, as the future chair. Um, and the final note that I would kind of like to to make, and I won't make you raise your hands uh, now in the room, um, but when we asked for responses, more than 60% of people who responded were not ARG members. So what we should take as a group from that is who are those people? Uh, why are they not part of our group? How can we help them to be part of our group? What What is it that we're not offering that, that would be useful to them? Uh, what is it that they have that, that could uh, synthesize and be useful to us as a group? Um, a little bit of outreach work to do there. So in my very final slide, or Rachel's very final slide, um, there will be a report on this in ARG News, which will probably be uh, much, much nicer than sitting and listening to me about it. Uh, the data has been archived on Zenodo, so you can access that for yourself and go and have a dig around on it. As I mentioned, this is supposed to be the first of a series um, of, of baseline um, surveys undertaken in the same manner so that we can start to look at change over time. Um, um, and then finally, uh, to look with both the ARG and the AAC working group at the sort of actions that we could take from this survey that would help to better serve our community um, in, in the short, medium and longer term. Thank you so much for listening.